nice distinction to orient our discussion today between horizontal diffusion of information and vertical inspiration. Horizontal is the ordinary, vertical is the extraordinary. Horizontal is human to human transfer of information. Like right now, if you had heard of this distinction before, now you know it and it's been transferred to you from me, a human, to you, a human. So we're on the same level and therefore the diffusion of the distinction was horizontal. But when we receive information from entities, from gods, from higher spirits, that's vertical inspiration. Vertical inspiration is Moses on the mountain receiving the bolt of information from Yahweh. Um, and we'll talk today about the, the specter of vertical inspiration in the history of scientific progress. This aspect of science, the fact that much of its premises have been transferred to mankind from the hidden realm of higher intelligence, is completely suppressed in its own official story. The official history tells the story of rational thought, of conquering the dark world of superstition. So the standard scientific history is of reason, overcoming religion, uh, humanity's reliance on the gods as explanatory principles is, uh, is defeated by the emergence of purely naturalist explanation discerned through the discerning rational mind. This is the official popular scientific story and McKenna is providing a counter narrative and perhaps overstating his case. But, uh, but I think, I think there's no doubt that the, the actual history is more complicated. Maybe that's a, to be expected. The, 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 the true rich history is more complicated than the popular common story we, we have almost always. And when you, when you look at some of the great figures at the, at the core of, uh, science, it's key figures. You find a more complicated, psychology for sure. These are not figures who were uh, pure rationalists, uh, anomalous in a religiously superstitious culture. These were uh, figures who whose rational inquiry was guided by their communication with superhuman entities or in their view that's what was going on let's take the most recent of our three examples first so here's kakule commemorated on the german stamp for his discovery of the benzene molecule a problem which had occupied many of his 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 colleagues they knew the benzene molecule existed and they couldn't figure out its structure and then Kakule is visited in a dream by the Ouroboros, this ancient symbol of infinity, perhaps more ominously a, a symbol of self-destruction or of maybe cancer, of life gone hypertrophic and now consuming itself. And ominous, if we think about benzene as a key moment in the emergence of the synthetic 20th century, which is also a century of carcinogens being released into our ecosystem. But, uh, but uh, Kakule is given the answer to the great problem in the in this appearance of, of an ominous, uh, numinous serpent. Now, this is this is a, a story which is not suppressed in the official story. Uh, the Kakule's serpent is well known and i'm not sure i don't know what kakule himself thought about the ontology of the serpent we don't have to suppose that kakule uh, believed he was visited by an ancient snake deity it's uh, 
I mean, the, the naturalist way of understanding anyway, what happened to Kukule is that his unconscious generated for him a summation in, in this, in this symbolic form of his own, uh, conscious, rational daylight cogitations that our dreams speak to us, that in our dreams a, a deeper part of our own self speaks to us. And that's not supernatural. And that's, you know, that's accepted that very creative scientific minds will often uh, engage in thought experiments and uh, imaginative, imaginative processes that can't be easily explained or quantified and we can we can let that into scientific psychology without without letting in anything supernatural but when we talk about descartes and later socrates here we have figures who interpreted their own interchange with these entities in a supernatural way descartes has three prophetic dreams as a young man which really set the program for his own uh, rationalist career and really uh, um, help to lay the foundations for the, you know, the modern adventure of science. Descartes is very obsessed with, very interested in the foundations of science. And the angel of truth visits him in a single night in a series of three dreams. And Descartes uh, commits the dreams. When he wakes up, he commits them to paper and puts them in a journal that he carries around his neck the rest of his life. These, these dreams uh, guide him in his investigations. And in, in one report I've, I've come across, the angel in one dream told him to master nature through measure and number, which is pretty good advice. If you're the angel of truth and you want to, uh, Know, give give inspiration to a burgeoning scientific culture you will appear to one of its leading lights and you've got a minute with them or you know the, the the communication channel is not open for very long what do you tell them do you do you quickly whisper into their ear the table of elements and sequence do you uh, quickly try, just try to wikipedia style <laughs> download into them a, a few key articles and 20th century physics, well, you could do that, but uh, the problem there is that even for such a, such a powerful mind as Descartes, the recipient might lack the appropriate context to make sense of what you're telling them. Um, I mean, Descartes doesn't know what hydrogen is. and doesn't have the chemical foundations to even um, make sense of things like atomic weight. So... Maybe this is great advice. Instead of giving a man a fish, you teach the man to fish, and then they can figure it out for themselves. Quantify, analyze, measure, and, and see what happens. See what happens. So Descartes the Catholic believed that the foundations of, of modern science were being communicated to humanity by an angel or a messenger of, of God. The epistemological systems that have been developed since the time of Descartes have often been ingenious, but all of them are marked by the same curious fact. They leave out the angel of truth, as indeed Descartes himself did. Descartes did not include as step one in his discourse on method, in his advice to fellow humans on how to do science. Descartes did not say step one, become receptive to the angel of truth. But actually that is, that is great advice. If there are higher entities who know more than you, the most efficient way of understanding nature is to receive orientation from those who know more. That is the rational thing to do, to defer, at least in part, 
to authority. And so uh, the angel of truth has been excised from our, our methodology. But I think McKenna's point is the angel of truth has been hovering there all along. And when we tell the story of how humans, how the zebra got its stripes, how humans got to be so smart and figure out so much about nature, um, we, can't, we can't keep the angel out. Uh, whatever the angel is. Now, maybe the angel is not literally a messenger of the Catholic God. That's how Descartes thought of it. But maybe the angel is a little bit just like Kekulé's dream serpent, a manifestation of Descartes' own Catholic subconscious um, communicating to Descartes things his, his own deeper self knew. But uh, at minimum, I think we could take as, as McKenna's minimum minimal thesis. The psychology of our scientific leaders and founders has been more complicated than the official history uh, lets on. The great martyr of reason. This is uh, rationalism's Jesus, someone who, who dies for the cause. Socrates is executed at the end of his life. Well, of course, of course, at the end of his life. As an old man, he is executed by the Athenian people. Um, and the official charges were first asabaya or impiety, not for disbelieving in the gods altogether, but introducing new gods. This is important to emphasize because, you know, the way I had received the story of Socrates' martyrdom and uh, you know, I think the way it's often processed by people coming up through undergraduate philosophy is Socrates was probably some kind of closet atheist or some proto-modern rationalist who was anachronistic, out of time and place, and therefore rubbed against uh, the powers that were and rubbed against religious pieties and offended those pieties and eventually had to go. Uh, the second charge was corrupting the Athenian youth by teaching them to doubt. <laughs> um, but the introducing new gods is, is, is our focus here. What were, the, what were these new gods that Socrates believed in? In fact, if you read the speech that Socrates gave at his own trial, he, he acted as his own uh, counsel or uh, advocate. Speaks of the oracle. It was his personal oracle. It was his, he also, also called it his daimon. This was a, some kind of a divine or demi-divine communicator that was in regular contact with Socrates since, since he was a young man. It would speak to him and guide his rational mission. It would, it would advise him often through negation. It would, by the sign of opposition, tell him which path not to take and therefore imply a path which would lead him on his rationalist adventures. It would guide him to the right person that day to engage in dialogue with. On the very day of his trial, it guided him to the trial. Socrates is here saying, I'm not worried about what's going on today because my, my oracle made no sign of opposition. <clears throat> and here I am. And so if I'm going to die, that's all right. The oracle has guided me well through my life. And so you see here, Socrates is making an argument and uh, it's a kind of model of rationalism, of independent rational thought. But if you ask Socrates <clears throat> what was going on, he would say he was often being guided by this, this oracle. And this goes back, as we've seen, to, to his, or it includes his, his famous encounter with the oracle at Delphi. The guiding spirit of modern science, according to the Faust myth, is a satanic demon, a fallen angel called Mephistopheles. Here's Mephistopheles, we'll just say the devil. Here's the devil. Here's the devil. 
And the other guy in each picture is Faust. Faust is a scholar. Faust is a supreme scholar who is at the cutting edge of all of his day's sciences. He's, in fact, at the beginning of the story, bemoaning his exhaustion of his own abilities. He's reached his own limits, yet his ambition for knowledge is limitless. He's a noble figure. He's, he's driven by a desire for knowledge, and this is his maybe tragic flaw. It's an imbalance in his personality, and that's why he's willing to sell his soul to know the devil appears and says, you know, you, you called. Here I am. I can give you what it is you seek. The devil promises to hand the book of nature over to Faust. And the book of nature shall lay open to your gaze for 24 years, at the end of which I will come back and collect your soul. We have to ask here in this myth, which is Germany's national myth, and it's also this trans-European myth that emerges from the medieval period um, to be articulated just as uh, science is sort of emerging as this dominant cultural force. It's the European mind warning itself of this darker side of science. And we have to ask what the soul represents here. What is it we give up in gaining scientific mastery? And then we also have to ask, what is it the devil gained? What, what's, what's in it for the devil? Why have they appeared to us and why are they helping us? And what do they get out of all this? So, um, entities in the history of scientific inquiry and dark entities possibly too that we've received input not not just from benign angels who want humans to know and to control nature but from entities who have motivations that ultimately don't align with our own we'll talk later in the course about religion uh, this is dennett's idea of religion being a kind of cultural parasite that uses us to get itself reproduced and ultimately harms us is not aligned with our own interests and you can at least consider hypothetically any cultural phenomenon having this parasitic quality and science seems so obviously useful um, that it's maybe harder to think of it in this way but especially as we we make our way through this very apocalyptic, ecologically destructive manifestation of technological mastery. We might, we might ask about its roots in the scientific project and think about the ways that scientific understanding has, has, um, led to our destruction. Our topic today is entities, which is a nice catch-all term for uh, weird stuff like angels and muses and UFOs. We'll talk now about the UFO, which is clearly an object of scientific technology, but also among the recent of a long lineage of entities who've somehow reached out and made contact with, uh, with humanity. Davis, um, I think, nicely summarizes the UFO as a cultural phenomenon. There's, I guess, what, agreement that the UFO is all of these things. The UFO is in, in cultural experience, in, in popular imagination. It's the 
ultimate super scientific machine. It's a it's a spaceship, but it's it's this usually disc like summation of technology straight from the radiating heart of post-war technoculture. Uh, if you ask when is the UFO, it's post-war, post-World War II. It's curiously, maybe uh, suspiciously, time to arrive right with the ascent of humanity's own aerospace um, ventures. It's a visionary pop mythology. It's it's it has it's a element of of our mythology and uh, popular meaning. Well, I suppose the living mythology of a culture is always is always pop. <clears throat> it's the ancient forgotten ones that become the providence of of Greek scholars and Sanskritists directly engages the question of technology. So if in figuring out the UFO as a cultural phenomenon, we'll figure out something about our relationship with with technology, surely. And uh, I guess the idea is every UFO movie is is telling us something about our relationship with technology. So this is all this is all pretty uncontroversial. This is decent, um, you know, cultural anthropology of the UFO as, as an idea in the imagination. But is it real? <laughs> Davis is aware that this is the question that we're chomping at the bit with. And uh, I mean, somewhat frustratingly or um, um, dallyingly, Davis points that the, the question of whether or not UFOs are quote unquote real is alternately too crude or too philosophically taxing to broach. So taking those one at a time, is it real is, is a crude question in that it seems like you're, you're, you're just asking the banal question of whether uh, literal physical spacecrafts from extra planetary civilizations have entered Earth space. And well, I think Davis would agree that's an interesting question. And it would be amazing if we could confirm that that happened. And and I'm, I'm sure he'd be among us lining up to meet meet our alien visitors. But um, uh, there's, there's a more interesting UFO that Davis is on the hunt for here. Uh, a subtler, more abstract UFO, and that's the Jacques Vallée UFO. We're we're mainly using Davis's chapter as a as a window into the theory of, of Jacques Vallée. It's a it's a very interesting take on on the question of whether the UFO is real. Vallée will give an answer to that, but um, but the UFO Vallée is chasing is not is not the literal physical spacecraft nor is it merely the cultural phenomenon we just referred to of course everybody agrees that the cultural phenomenon of the ufo is exists that's not not up for debate um, so we'll see what it is valley is is looking for anyway uh alternately too crude or philosophically taxing meaning the question could devolve into a debate of philosophy of language or ontology where we could spend a whole PhD worrying ourselves about what we mean by by real UFO is a acronym that emerges from pilot call signing uh, I guess, I guess, in in its literal original sense, as an un unidentified flying object, there's no doubt UFOs exist. The the military, in that sense, would absolutely confirm. The American government would absolutely confirm. There have been many, many official UFO sightings, just in the sense that pilots have indeed encountered, probably thousands of times in, in say, World War II unidentified flying objects, just flying objects that the pilot was not able to identify by make and model or nationality. And the 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 sci-fi UFO is the sci-fact UFO is 
is the one that's not of this earth that we can't identify because it is absolutely unlike anything the Germans or Japanese would have made and um, not local, not local. There's another possible reading of the you. This is, this is not what the you meant in original call sign language, but an unidentifiable meaning somehow absolutely unidentifiable, a phenomenon which by its very nature is peripheral, right? Uh, when you turn to look at it directly, it disappears or dissipates. And I think there's a sense in which the valley UFO is this, call it a deeper UFO. The deeper U is the is stands for unidentifiable unidentified means just as of yet we we can't name it but we could learn about this japanese test craft or if it turns out to be vegan or martian we could learn about that someday too but as of yet it's unidentified the unidentifiable ufo is much weirder it really takes us into the into the territory of something like like the gods, the gods, maybe by their very nature, but by, by, by virtue of being from a higher realm, a realm which is vastly beyond our experience and, and comprehension. The gods are, to us, beyond strict identification. We refer to them through metaphor and through this kind of anthropomorphic projection we make th we make them in our representations familiar or like us in order to get get a grip on them but they are by their nature beyond our comprehension and direct perception the gods might make themselves like us too the gods in coming down to us might incarnate and take on form that is familiar to us so we can understand them and and the valley ufo might do this too it might enter earth space as it were uh, in a form familiar to us maybe maybe it will dress up as a as a uh, literal sighting of a spacecraft darting through the sky um, hermes is is the greek messenger god and a very special god i mean i guess if you to worship a god is in a sense to think of that god as as ultimate as the pinnacle or having the the special superpower each god has its own superpower hermes is the messenger god and if you think about what it takes to be a messenger you might start to think hermes is is pretty special maybe even more powerful than than say zeus i think there are there are stories in greek mythology of, of zeus coming to earth but it happens occasionally and uh, it's not something I think Zeus does easily. Or when Zeus does it, uh, there's hell to pay back home. Usually um, it creates great uh, disturbance in his domestic life when he, when he returns. And that's often because he incarnates to have a sexual liaison with a beautiful human female. But um, Hermes has this ability to dart. You can see how swift he's. Swift he is in this typical depiction. He uh, darts between heaven and earth, between the realm of the gods and and the realm of man. And this is something the other gods can't do very easily. Hermes can very easily and quickly move between heaven and earth and bring information from one realm to the other. Um, and Hermes is a... Uh, Therefore, a god of transitions and boundaries, not just not just messaging. To be an effective messenger, you have to be a master of transitions and boundaries. And it's fast and clever, of course. Um, the fast is 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 maybe not in need of explanation. Heaven's far away, Olympus is high, and to effectively mediate communication you need to move quickly 
cleverness is a bit trickier to understand. I mean, I guess we could start by uh, noticing that to to message from the gods to humans, Hermes will need to know two languages. So we'll have that. Uh, uh, and, and not just, you know, knowing French and English, but two very different languages, two very different modes of perception and being. And so Hermes would have that double mind we, we uh, associate with, with, say, irony and um, humor, too. Um, Hermes is a, a moving freely between the gods and mortals, has some of the levity we associate with humor and has this double mindedness we associate with irony and with with humor. Uh, uh, Someone who's got an outside perspective on the given scene is prone to develop a sense of humor about it. And uh, Hermes is perpetually outside the scene he's in because he's aware of uh, when on Earth, he's aware of heaven and when on in heaven, he's aware of Earth. So this is uh, this is, uh, you know, the archetype Hermes and Vali treats uh, Hermes, uh, the UFO as a hermetic phenomenon that if, if you had to pick a god to associate with Hermes, uh, sorry, a god to associate with the UFO, it, it would be Hermes. And the UFO is maybe just a modern techno-culture's uh, repackaging of, of a much more ancient Hermetic archetype. Hermes is a trickster deity. Uh, tricksters uh, don't communicate in a straight way. They speak uh, with irony and with a double tongue and uh, maybe communicate through riddles. The trickster's intentions are sometimes hard to read. The trickster might be benign, might actually uh, want to help us, but for reasons we'll, we'll maybe explore, uh, has found this, this form of communication, which is, which is indirect and layered in irony, perhaps, and even contradiction. Think of the UFO, this alien intelligence, as one whose, whose message seems almost intentionally tangled inside a briar patch of rumor and report, pop archetype, and con job, evidence and hoax, rumor and report, evidence and hoax. These are contrasting pairs or contradictions. And the the communication, if we take the, the alien's arrival as, as a communication to humanity, it comes in this, according to Vali, it comes in this ordered set of, of contradictions. It's not that, I mean, here we're getting to the key idea in, in Valley's interpretation. It's not that here is where the UFO is speaking. Here is where we uh, find the true UFO. And this is what we cancel out as the noise or the obfuscation in the evidence. It's that the true, the deep, weird UFO that Valley is tracking is appears in or is is the conjunction of of these contradictory elements that the total hermetic communication includes these contradictions so one way of thinking about the ufo trail is in the literal trail of energetic exhaust coming from the literal spacecraft as it traverses earth space here's a shot of a of a real ufo just in the in the original sense of unidentified or for a time this was an unidentified spacecraft that uh, darted in the sky by this chinese airport in 2010. here's another way of thinking about the ufo trail if we treat the ufo as a informational phenomenon that ultimately the ufo is an informational hermetic message uh, 
then the trail would be a bit more abstract. It wouldn't be a literal energetic exhaust. It would be the trail of information or um, um, trail of communication that the UFO leaves in its wake. For example, when the UFO traverses Earth space, we start talking about it. We chatter about it. We tweet about it. We we debate it. And the debate can take the form of affirmations and denials. Uh, we find compelling evidence and then we find disconfirmations of the evidence or or evidence of genuine hoax going on these think of these as the ones and zeros in human um, discourse about the ufo once it traverses earth space or as as it's traversing earth space so this is the informational exhaust or trail of the ufo one and zero think of the ones in our talk as again the affirmations and the zeros as the denials and valley says you'll find and this is this is not uh, exclusive to the ufo for any controversial phenomenon you'll find in our talk about it ones and zeros for valley this is the this is the essence of the ufo the ufo is almost it is um, the series of ones and zeros that arise in its wake. So here's uh, the one from the Zhaoshan Airport sighting. Zhaoshan Airport was closed after the UFO was detected at around 9 p.m. and dozens of flights had to be diverted. Stunned witnesses reported seeing a comet like fireball in the sky and a number of local residents took photos of a strange ball of light. So what is it? We saw the U and then here's here's at least a zero, here's a retraction. Chinese officials, believe them or not, later said that they knew what the object had been but were unable to make it public because there was a military connection. <laughs> Almost suspicious that they'd, they'd, they'd allow that it was some kind of secret military uh, craft. Um, if they're, they're willing to say that, it maybe means they're hiding something much worse. But. Uh, but here the Chinese officials are eliminating the U. They're, they're giving a, a measure of identification to it and confirming that it's, it's local. It's not, it's not alien. So one, we got a one and then we got a, a zero, right? And this is, according to Valley, typical of, of the UFO, that this is what you'll always find in the wake of the true hermetic uh, traversion of Earth space. Another one, this is really uh, the original uh, one and zero of, of American ufology. This is Roswell. This is where, I mean, the one was a really uh, a high quality one. It was an army official, Roswell Army Airfield, confirming to the media that the many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday. So sci-fi became sci-fact. We, we found one. We recovered it. And then a zero from a, I think, a higher ranking official uh, canceling the one of Walter Hout. So this is <clears throat> the, the official word, the official reaction, the uh, governmental reaction to this New Mexican UFO was, again, one and zero. Roswell is is sort of ground zero of American ufology, and it's got this very dramatic one and zero at the heart of it. Now notice that if, if you're a, a believer in the alien UFO, and you believe that Walter Hout had spoken the truth and then, and then um, the army covered it up, the zero actually serves to reinforce the one. The zero is, is what you predict. You predict that if someone in the military revealed to the public that the UFO had been recovered, the reaction of, of, of the government would be to deny that very quickly and vociferously. So the zeros, if, if you're on the one side, the zeros end up confirming the one and the zeros are what you'd expect of an extraordinary phenomenon. You know, if God enters Earth, you'd expect 
him to be loved and also executed by the powers that be. This is what you predict of something extraordinary entering Earth space. There's a recent UFO, again, a genuine UFO, meaning we have trouble identifying it. This is Oumuamua, the Hawaiian name. I think it means alien visitor. And we had to create a new category for it. It's our first sighted interstellar object, meaning the, fir the first uh, interstellar object that has come into the solar system. This was when I learned about this. This was surprising to me. I guess I had, with my very limited knowledge of, of astronomy, assumed that some of the stuff we've been spotting, the comets and what have you, were not from the solar system, but, but apparently they all are. They all are um, gravitationally bound to the sun. And Oumuamua was the first object from outside our star system to pass through our star system. You can see it almost. I mean, this seems to be part of its message that it almost hits us twice. And... Um, we had trouble identifying it. There was first, the first official designation was that it was some kind of comet, and then finally they decided it's it's an asteroid. But but it's it's they had to create this new class of object, interstellar object, and um, so you can see Oumuamua has has many of the qualities of the Valley in UFO. It it um, there's a debate about it. I mean, this is again typical of anything that is of, of interest and somewhat mysterious to us. We'll get ones and zeros about it for a long time. Um, but if, we, if, if we're talking about the deep UFO, if we're talking about gods or the deep valley in UFO, I think the idea is that we'll, we'll properly have ones and zeros and we'll never have anything but ones and zeros about it. And we should maybe think about treating the trail of ones and zeros as the thing itself that the physical or seeming physical appearance of of the ufo is merely the trigger for the informational series of ones and zeros and that the ufo proper is that informational trail think about what the word alien means there is a kind of paradox in the appearance of the alien. The alien is something other. It's different from us. And if it's truly alien and not just a little bit weird. So here's just here's an alien that's just a little bit weird. It's quite humanoid and quite familiar in the end. They just changed human features a little bit to to seem different. But really, this is quite familiar. Here's a much weirder alien. This is the way Carl Sagan imagined the deep alien, a creature so different from humans. This is the human sort of astronaut who's, who's making first contact with an alien species. And the alien has, for our benefit, appeared in a familiar form, in, in actually the form of um, Ellie Arroway's father, long departed father, so she's comfortable. Um, he wanted her, he or it wanted her to be comfortable. So took on incarnated in human form. Um, the deep alien will be so different from us that it will actually have a very hard time appearing. To appear, to be comprehensible and perceivable to us, it needs to change. It needs to take on a very different form. So there's this kind of paradox, or you can at least call it a engineering problem for any prospective alien. If, if the alien is contemplating coming to Earth and speaking to the humans, it's got a bit of a, uh, you know, an engineering task, which is to figure out how to, how to appear in a way that its form isn't, isn't altered so much that it's no longer perceived as alien, right? If you, if you become too much like, like the human, then the human just thinks you're human. human. And uh, I guess that's part of the, the story of the incarnation of, of 
Yahweh into into earth space that to enter earth space Yahweh becomes human to be comprehensible to us Yahweh becomes human and thereby takes on the risk of being mistaken as merely human miracles notwithstanding <clears throat> miracles are maybe one, one of the uh, engineering solutions Yahweh came up with well I'll become human but I'll demonstrate mastery over the natural system so so they realize I'm not I'm not local here's Krishna who's the incarnation of Vishnu one of several incarnations of Vishnu and the same the same uh, difficulty that the gods would have in coming to earth is is the one that the aliens would have too the the deep the really weird aliens who might be even you know uh, from outside of our universe from outside of physical reality um and valise answer is kind of interesting Val valise answer to this engineering problem is is that the alien appears in a string of ones and zeros in this very complex cultural performance and maybe if you string the ones and zeros together in the right way if you know your ufology has the task of pouring through the 20th century data the reports and the rumors and identifying that, okay here's a one and here's a zero and then stringing them together maybe chronologically that's one possible ordering and seeing what in in sort of binary code the ones and zeros add up to uh, deciphering that 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 uh, message from the heavens and if the ones and zeros in fact compute if if they end up translating into a complex coherent message that passes some very high level uh, turing test then you step back from the data and you say wow what what kind of power could arrange our cultural reaction right so that it form this coherent string of ones and zeros that implies not just technological civilization which can create very fast spaceships but that implies a godlike control over cultural reactions to its appearance and that again is is what we associate with with the gods so the deep the deep alien ends up being quite continuous with the gods and its power and uh, is hermetic not just by sort of symbolic association but also by kind of ontological equality with with the gods <clears throat>